So I will look into the European forest and forest industry. Does it, does it have a future? That's the, that's the question. So European forest industry in a changing climate and policy arena, a fast changing uh, arena. How, how resilient is it and which road does it take? It's going to be a long road, a windy road. We're going to look into that. And uh, well, I'm from Wageningen. I'm professor of European forest resources. I was in the IPCC uh, several times and uh, I did my PhD at the well, European Forest Institute with Risto at that time there and Birger. So I, I owe these people uh, a lot. So then you see how generations move on and the new generation is, is there in the back. So we're going to look into some climate change projections. That's the first thing to do. Then uh, what's the state of the European forest resources now? The, the supply side, the management a little bit. Then we're going to look into some of the policy arena, the fast changing uh, policy arena that affects us all. And then a little bit on the industry, a little bit of, we're going to look into some trends and new developments and come to some conclusions. But first, something slightly different, maybe. This is the deed of sales uh, with which my grandpa and grandma bought their first three hectare farm in 1913. Anton Nabius and Maria Nabius bought that at the edge of a swamp, poor soil, three hectares, harsh times. But what we found, we found this deed uh, just uh, five years ago. But what it said there in this last article, it says that those who sell the farm reserve two oaks, one alder, and some coppice. So wood was so scarce in those days that they took it even out of the sale, and the previous owner wanted to keep those two oaks and one alder. This is how scarce wood was in those years, we in the Netherlands, but also in Central Europe, certainly. We can hardly imagine this anymore. So nowadays we seem to have ample resources, but let's see if that is all available. Uh, a little bit on climate. Well, I'm also sorry to say, but we are all addicted to fossil carbon, all of us, myself inclusive. And we are probably amongst uh, the top emitters in the world. Here you see the, well, this is in, in case of global primary energy consumption, how this has increased since pre-industrial times with traditional biomass still there. Joseph also mentioned that. Then coal came up, then oil, uh, uh, gas, natural gas, and then some new forms, nuclear, hydropower, wind, etc. You see that despite a lot of effort to reduce emissions, uh, the, the consumption just keeps going up. The emissions just keep going up. There's a little bit of modern biofuels and solar, the yellow line that you can just barely see there. But, but this upcoming of new types of renewable energy is just, well, doesn't even, even bring down the line. But it just, uh, well, it, it, it seems to ju just add on to our consumption. So that's clearly the, the trend, unfortunately, that we're going. And it seems we're not really able to stop that development. Uh, and this, of course, there's no doubt about it, that with these increasing greenhouse gas emissions, we, will, we are on this path of a three degree climate change. The yellow line is clearly the path on which we are. So there's no doubt, well, maybe the extremes will hopefully not come through, but even uh, uh, an SSP2, four and a half, which is roughly three degree change, a three degree global change average is an enormous change in, 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 in weather and weather extremes in, in the world. And we're right on that path. So what does that mean for the resources? Well, this will certainly m mean that if we look at this tree species map of Europe, that these species distributions are going to change. You know, trees have their niche in which they like to grow, the climate and weather circumstances and soils where they like to grow 
Uh, with a changing climate, this is certainly going to change. The light green here is the spruce, productive areas in Central Europe, but also in, in the north, the, uh, the, the, the spruce and, and pine will be affected by these climate changes and, and the weather extremes especially. Still, there seem to be ample resources. There's, there's more wood than ever since early medieval times, 30 billion cubic meters, unprecedented. But it doesn't mean that it's all available. It doesn't mean that there is ample resources also available. Europe was, and still is, I think, producing from these large forest areas, 40% of Europe covered with, with forest, Europe is still a main wood producer. Here you see the development of, uh, of wood harvesting in Europe, starting around 400 million cubic meters in the, in, the, in the late 90s, peaking in 2007 before the financial crisis and then uh, lowering a bit, but then picking up again in, in harvest uh, volumes, now over 500 million cubic meters. The growth is much more. The growth is roughly 800 million cubic meters. So you would think this 300 million cubic meters should be, should be possible to, uh, to harvest that, to, to have an additional harvest. But we'll, we'll look into that, that that is not going to be so simple. And what's more, if you look at what sort of assortments we are harvesting, I think we are not using this very efficiently. The industry tends to be very proud of itself and say, oh, we're very efficient, we, uh, we recycle paper, etc. But if you look at the total harvest in Europe, the green part is all fuel wood. That's already a lot of private households that are directly burning wood in their household stove at a low, uh, low efficiency. Also a little bit of new, uh, new types of uh, uh, biomass, uh, bioenergy, of course, but a lot is, is private households. The saw logs, well, when you do the sawing, you, you're happy if you have a 50% uh, efficiency. So the other 50%, well, partly goes to the pulp and paper industry, I know, or to the panel industry, but also a large part of those sawing losses are also being burned. And then the pulp, the, the, the orange line, well, you're the experts here in the pulping, half of it is, becomes black liquor and is also being burned. So we're we are not using our resources very efficiently here. Pushing through very large volumes at a very high rate, uh, and mostly using it only once or very short. Of the sawing, well, if you, you manage to have the 50% efficiency, a lot of the sawn wood is also used only relatively short. Again, in, in crates and pallets, only a, short, a small part really ends up in construction. We can improve a lot, and we will have to. So that resource, um, you saw the tree species map with the spruce in, uh, in Central Europe. And uh, you know, I said, well, species have their, their niche where they like to grow. Well, this is spruce in, uh, in 2010, uh, 2040. Uh, we made a projection of that under a climate envelope uh, model. And just look at the reddish, this is where spruce uh, can occur already, it's a bit forward already, 2010, 2040. And then we projected that and calculated the, uh, the economic effects. And it should now move, yeah. So 2070, 2100, we projected that spruce would really move high north and would only survive really high north. And it's. Well, then we said, well, th this is a model, it's uh, 2070, 2100, it's far away. You know, let's, uh, let's not get too worried about that yet. But, uh, well, the actuality uh, was much faster. This is the, the spruce mortality in, in uh, Germany, in the Hertz, uh, a picture from the Hertz. All the brown is, of course, uh, dead spruce, but the bark beetle, uh, uh, the spruce, gets affected by drought and heat in the, in the hot summers and is very vulnerable to bark beetle. The spruce mortality is already over 200 million cubic meters, which is unprecedented kind of mortality in Europe. And uh, a colleague of us, Marco Pataka, also 
collected all that material and in, in the trend line of disturbances you clearly see that the disturbances are increasing. There is of course also more stock, so it percentage-wise it, it has also increased a bit, but, but percentage-wise not so much. But you clearly see the spruce coming in, or the, the, the bark beetle effects here very much. The yellow is, a, is the wind storms in the, in the 90s and the early 2000s. So these disturbances are taking place very rapidly. What does that mean then for your resources? And this graph, I must explain a bit, this is a, the carbon balance for the total Czech forests. Um, a negative means that the forests are taking up carbon, so it, it pulls it out of the atmosphere, so this is why it's a negative. And this is how Spruce is reporting to the UNFCCC its sink in the forest. So they reported up to 20, uh, 2015 a sink, a considerable sink of something like 8 million tons of CO2. We then saw these Spruce problems occurring and we, we implemented in our forward projection model a, uh, a conversion forestry where you gradually convert spruce into longer rotation uh, deciduous, mostly beech, uh, often there. And then when you do this conversion, of course, you take your, your resource through a source. When it's a plus, it's a source to the atmosphere. But we thought that if you do that conversion gradually, you can sort of try to maintain that sink, and, and the new regrowing forest will, will maintain that sink. But also there, the actuality was much different. When we looked a couple of years later at how Czech is reporting to the UNFCCC, the last couple of years they have reported a large source of CO2. So the, the conversion or the, well the mortality goes so fast and the balance of whether you have your forest resource functioning as a sink or a source, that balance is very delicate. And if you have these rapid changes, your resource immediately uh, shoots into a source of CO2. So also this uh, projection uh, we can throw in the trash bin, this one. As, as often, our projections are not predictions. But it's not only mortality, it's also subtle growth changes that are taking place, the droughts. And this is from, uh, from Antti, from, from Luke, where also uh, the, the NFI from Finland is reporting an, an increment decrease now. And since they are harvesting uh, more, this, this they're getting very close in the balance of, of gr uh, growth and the amount of what you can harvest. So also there, these, these northern countries, also Sweden has a, has a comparable problem, but Finland also has that problem. I'm sorry that I cannot be more positive, but uh, yeah. So it seems that production is shifting south and there's of course also other trends and other uh, drivers that have pushed the production very much to the south. In the, the, the northwest of the US, the production moved especially to the southeast, the Atlantic zone of, of Brazil with eucalyptus uh, plantations. South Africa was a, a reasonable uh, production zone. China is coming up with a lot of uh, new plantations. And also here in, in the New Zealand and the Australian area, the production is, is increasing. So it seems that from the traditional US, Europe, as the, the, the main forest industry countries, that this production is moving south. And it's not only that, we also have other problems, geopolitical. Well, Russia is basically out of the trade for the next 10 to 20 years. So also that enormous resource, or a quarter of the world forest, is basically out of the, of the trade. So, we saw this, uh, Russian wood to a large degree off the market, strong protection in Europe. Uh, is also taking place. Uh, fragmented ownership uh, plays its role as well. Uh, and other regions, well, uh, an example is, for example, British Columbia has been a very uh, important producing region, but because it's sort of oversupplied due to also mountain pine beetle problems, it oversupplied for a time, so they will start undersupplying in the, in the coming years. And of course, in Europe, we will come to that as well, 
protection, uh, well, biodiversity is under pressure and, and changing the management and partly protecting uh, and changing the management is, uh, is a direction that Europe is taking uh, as well. And if you ever come to the Netherlands, you can visit these, uh, these beautiful forests there. A little bit about the policies. And, uh, well, the, you might think there's not a, a policy uh, photo here, but policy is, is about people. It's all about people. We talk a lot about trees, but in fact it's all about people, what we're doing. And this is a, a walnut provenance trial that, that we have. So the EU policy environment was very simple up until the, the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, there was a common agricultural policy, there was a bit of a forest strategy, rather simple, a strategy doesn't say much, some action plans and uh, some forest, some life programs in the execution, but, well, and there was international processes, so it was very simple. Also then, well, many also complained that Brussels was not interested, didn't have an interest in forest. But I think we have nothing to complain about anymore. Well, uh, you don't need to read all of this. You can l later look at it at the slides. But uh, yeah, there's an, an enormous uh, growth of, uh, of regulations and, and strategies related to forests. And I must thank uh, Helga Pulsel here of, uh, of EFI. Um, well, just <laughs> well, only just last Sunday, the, the forest monitoring regulation uh, came out or leaked or whatever you want to call it. There's this, uh, where, where am I? Uh, I can't even find it here. Um, the nature restoration law, of course, heavily discussed, uh, resulting also in guidelines, uh, the regulation on, on the, the non-deforestation goods, uh, the birds and habitats directive, still active, renewable energy directives. There's a massive growth of all sort of policies related to forests. And that is the arena in which the member states, the industry in my mind, the forest owners and the commission in this uh, wild arena, they have to find uh, their, uh, well, the common ground. But this massive growth of policies also leads to what is called the responsiveness gap. The, the, the member states and, and the, uh, well, the active forest owners, they basically don't know what to do anymore. Some policies push for sink, the LULUCF policies, other policies push towards more, more wood harvesting, bioeconomy, renewable energy directive, etc. So going in, in, a, in a wide direction. And when is it good and when is it not good? That's, I think nobody has the answer to that. A little bit on the industry. How has the industry functioned here? And this is from the Finnish forest industries. Well, you see the, 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 the production lines generally moving up, also in line with, with the harvesting volumes that have moved up. I think the, the main change that has taken place, of course, is that newspaper print really went down and other commodities uh, have, have gradually, well, cardboard and such for the online shopping, they, they gradually took over. That is the main change, I think, that has taken place. And of course, a large interest in these new bio-based products. You also see them on the posters here outside. Uh, bio-based products, wood-based textiles, where well, you see the, the, in, the investments in, in, the, in refineries, in, uh, in wood-based foam, many, much research and startups in these new, new products. But really breaking through, that is difficult, as long as we have ample resources of cheap fossil carbon. It's very difficult to break through in, uh, in such a world. And only with, I don't know what, maybe taxes or uh, on, on or taking out these cheap fossil uh, access, only then these new products can break through. And it's resource constraint. I showed you the problems in the resource. If you really want to go to high volumes, large volumes of these new products, it is resource constraint. A little bit about what we do then in Wageningen. 
together also with the European Forest Institute. Well, what we do is, is resource modeling, resource model pro projection at a high detailed level. Uh, since about 10 years, we are collecting the national forest inventory plot data, the raw tree-wise data. And uh, luckily, 18 countries are willing to share that. It's already 18 now. That's 4.6 remeasured trees. And if you have 4.6 million remeasured trees, then you know what is really going on. You can assess the, the, the growth, the mortalities, the, the ingrowth, who is harvesting, who is not harvesting, etc. And that's a, a picture of, of the data. And then basically every plot has a diameter distribution which you uh, forward project. But that's not so interesting now. And then we can forward project, for example, this restoration management. This is a map of uh, North Rhine-Westphalia, 900,000 hectares. Every bar is an NFI point. Um, and then you see that in the 2010, there's a, well, it's hard to see, but all the lightish colors are is spruce and such, large stocks of spruce uh, still. Um, but then in 2050, we, we convert that, or it has died basically already, so we convert that into, uh, into deciduous. And then you gradually see more green bars coming in, but still with a small volume. So even in 2050, you are still dealing with a small volume there, and then it's still e it's even deciduous wood. So the industry will have to adapt, or I, I don't know, maybe move move to other regions. And this is what we also do then, uh, very much in line with, with Joseph his, his work. But this has been done by Nicola Botsulan, one of the young researchers, collecting the mill site data, the individual mills with the capacity they have and, and the resources they need, and this is how he can uh, analyze from the procurement area of a mill, one specific mill, where it gets its wood from, how it can get its wood. Uh, for example, analyze where new mills can be established, where not given uh, the resource changes that I mentioned. I'm um, speed up. The last conclusion, um, our global demand certainly keeps increasing. Uh, certainly if we cannot use fossil carbon anymore, um, Changing resources, I highlighted the, the, the many policies, maybe too many policies. Certainly in Europe over the last five years, with the Green Deal very much focused also on protection. I do think that it's not very useful to fight against Brussels, but rather try to work with them. They are not going to go away, Brussels. So it's maybe better to try and have some influence and, and try to move that in a certain direction. In basically, we are all Brussels. We need better integrated models. Uh, the, the developments that Joseph sh showed and, and the other laureates, I don't think we have such tool, but Stan will, uh, will, uh, will move, go into that uh, very much. Um, but also the industry has a role in this. I think the industry also needs to invest in the forest resources and not, not only try and buy what, what is available. And then as last, as, as I, uh, I want to thank the team in Wageningen, it's, uh, it's their hard work that they do. And uh, as I said, it's, uh, well, we talk a lot about trees, but in, in, in fact, it's all about people. So, thank you. <laughs>